Happy Monday, everybody. Welcome to the Roarcast, presented by JAG1 Physical Therapy. I'm one of your co-hosts, Kyle Matrician, joined, as always, by my good friend and co-worker, Mike Kowalski, from right down 10 minutes down the road. How are you, Mike? I appreciate it. Doing great, Kyle. Yeah. 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 Good to see you again. Good to see you. Uh, Love the, uh, the, you know... Love that we're staying consistent with our backgrounds here. Love the uh, yep, love the New skyline you've got going on. I'm just looking at it from a different angle over here on Ellis <laughs> Island. So good to see you. Um, hope you had a great weekend. Hope everybody listening uh, had a great weekend. Uh, hopefully, if you're living in the Northeast, uh, it. I don't know how much everybody likes snow, but I think I've had, my share. I've had my share, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. You know, I've, I've, I've had my share. I'm kind of hoping that it's done, you know, what was it just last week or yeah, it was like it, it, maybe a week and a half ago uh, with Groundhog Day and I'm going to say this wrong. I, is it Puxatawney Phil? Is that how you yeah, say it? Yeah, you're right. Okay. Uh, predicted that there would be six more weeks of winter and I think he was absolutely correct. You know, there, <laughs> regardless of if he, she's his shadow, there's going to be six weeks of winter regardless because that's just life in the calendar. I mean, that's how the calendar works, but also with the amount of snow. I mean, we got to be, we got to be fair. <clears throat> we haven't had that much snow the last couple of years. Anymore. No, no. So Making I feel, up like, for I feel like we made up, we made up for lost ground. But if you're joining us on this Monday morning, uh, we've got a good episode for you this week. We've got four captains from the Columbia fencing team. We've got Anika Sapitzeris. We've got Leanne Choi. We've got Maria Chart. And we've got James Bordis joining us. Uh, for this episode, three of them, if you've watched uh, the episodes of Lions Feud that, uh, you know, spoiler alert, we got a celeb in the house right now, Mike Kowalski, the host of Lions Feud. The face of uh, Columbia Athletics Twitch. Yeah, that's right. You you really are. You're, you're on there the most. Lions. You are on there three days a week. <laughs> we could get you on there four days a week if you really want to be. I'm okay. <laughs> uh, we've had James, uh, we've had Maria, and we've had Leanne on Lions Feud. I feel like men's I, fencing well. I know men's, men's fencing basketball. did. Yeah, I knew they advanced. We had women's fencing on Lions Feud as well, but unfortunately, they got ousted. If you watch Lions Feud, you already know this. They got ousted in the first round by the wrestling team. But regardless, uh, three familiar faces to our Twitch, YouTube, social media channels, and a new face, as we mentioned. Uh, all the way from Greece. All the way from Greece. And joining us this week from Greece, uh, Anika Sabatseris, uh was also recently in the news. And I'll just kind of leave that teaser there and we'll let Anika talk about it as we, uh, after, after the break, when we come back and talk to the fencing team, we're going to let Anika share her recent uh, experience talking with, uh, uh, the only thing I'll say is the West Virginia news outlet, but it was not aired only in West Virginia. So you can definitely find it on the internet in their series called uh, The Road to Tokyo. Definitely uh, an interesting watch. They did a video, they did a really nice article, uh, great promotion for herself. Uh, competing, you know, as a Olympic hopeful in the years to come and great promotion for the Columbia fencing team as well. And Mike, I think with that, we're going to head to break. Yeah, we're going to take a short break. We'll be back with the Columbia fencing captain. So don't go anywhere. John, we're outside of JAG1. Tell us why this place is so important to your patients. We're serving New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania as an outpatient physical therapy and occupational therapy center. We've worked very hard in the last two years to bring us close to 100% in network in all our facilities. We treat every type of pathology and illness and surgical intervention. Taking that patient's needs and building the rehab program around that goal and attaining the goal. They say you play basketball, you play football, you play tennis, but you can't play boxing. You have to fight. I remember the night where it went completely downhill. It was a massive tumor that had wrapped itself around my spine. Dr. Hartle, who was my surgeon, you know, he aced it. They resurrected me. On August 9th, 2014, I became the WBA middleweight champion of the world. All right, welcome back to the Roarcast presented by JAG1 Physical Therapy. We've got a great episode for everybody this week, so we hope everybody's as excited as we are. We have the fencing captains. Anika Sapitseris, Leanne Choi, James Bordis, and Maria Chart joining us today from various locations. So welcome in, everybody. We appreciate you taking the time. Thanks so much for having us today. 
three of you, Bible. three of you are familiar faces because you were on our fencing, our, our, yeah, our two different fencing episodes <laughs> with Lions Feud. Uh, James had a lot of fun with that, as uh, if I remember correctly, when you guys, <laughs> you guys were actually all, I remember, uh, kind of in the same classroom together, and we had to get you on four different computers so that we could have all the windows up there, but you guys had a lot of fun, and I know the, the women's fencing team had a lot of fun with that as well. Anika, you're a little bit new to maybe some people that have been following our podcast and following our content that we've been putting on social media, but something I'm just going to bring up right away is you have been in the news lately, which was really cool. And I'm going to let you tell the story a little bit, but I know a West Virginia television NBC affiliate down in West Virginia is doing, uh, I believe it's called the Journey to, Journey to the Olympics, Road to Tokyo, Journey to Tokyo series. And uh, they featured you. And it was very interesting. I thought that it was a new station down in West Virginia, uh, but I know that it, they were, they're doing this series that's being aired in multiple markets, not just the West Virginia market, obviously. But uh, why don't you give us some insight into that and kind of how they found you and you know, everything that went into that? Absolutely. So I'll start off by saying I'm currently in Athens, Greece. So uh, clearly from the last name and the fact that I fence for Greece, I'm very tied to Greece. Uh, the anchor that interviewed me was actually Greek as well. So that's kind of where the connection came into play. Um, she had known me beforehand and had seen some of my training videos and asked if I was uh, training for the Olympics at some point. Uh, for me, it was uh, Tokyo 2020 has always been a little soon. It's been more 2024, 2028, but uh, she invited me to participate in this series called Journey to Tokyo. Uh, we had a long conversation, um, was able to send her some footage of things that I've been doing here in Greece. Um, Unfortunately, because the season was canceled, um, my decision to move to Greece was um, productive both for classes and for fencing. So I'm kind of living a double life right now. I'm living on both U.S. time and Greece time, but it's been a productive use of time just to be able to um, really focus on fencing and academics separately. And that's why I felt that this interview was important as well to kind of share what great things can come out of a pandemic like this. You know, I never thought a year ago that I would move across the world and kind of be on my own and um, really be able to focus on things. And it's been a true blessing in disguise. I was going to say, because you are from New Jersey, um, but I assume living in Greece, uh, you have some family members or people that are, do you have any family members that you're living with or are you completely living on your own? I'm living on my own. Um, on the other side of the apartment wall are some uh, family members. Of course, in Greece, there's no way to escape family. They're everywhere. Even <laughs> if you don't know it. <laughs> But um, I'm very lucky to have teammates, coaches, um, and of course, the family that has stayed in Greece that are very close to me. Um, so it's a perfect balance of, you know, being on my own in my apartment, having, um, I did get a dog two months ago just for a little bit more company, but also knowing that I have a support system wherever I go. Marie, you got some good service going on at your apartment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was my roommate. Very She's smoothly well done. <laughs> What did, what did we just get delivered? Uh, tea and biscuits. Um, I'm British, so it's, you know, always kind of consistently tea and biscuits that's, here. That's amazing. <laughs> Afternoon tea time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Love it. Uh, Maria, why don't, we, why don't we just kind of stick with that? Talk about uh, how you wound up in New York and your, your upbringing in the United Kingdom. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm very much a dual citizen um, of US and UK. I actually was born in Houston, um, grew up in the DC area and then moved to England in 2008. So I've lived there since I was nine um, and actually started fencing over there. But my sister um, started when we were still in the US and she actually graduated two years ago from Northwestern's fencing program. So big fen college fencing family. Um, and yeah, I kind of knew that I wanted to fence, um, continue fencing through college. And in the UK, the infrastructure wasn't really there to do that at a high level um, when I was looking at colleges. And I've always kind of liked the idea of a US college experience. Um, growing up here, that was kind of, you know, like the bastion. So yeah, um, I started looking at schools over here and, you know, little plug for Columbia, we are the best at fencing in the country. <laughs> um, and also like one of the best academic schools. So. Yeah, when Mike, I contacted Mike and eventually he agreed to recruit me and it was a no brainer. Talk a little bit, uh, why did you end up going to, to Great Britain in, when you were that young? Oh, so my dad is British okay. um, and he and my mom met actually in Ohio 
um, and mom's from Ohio. We spent a lot of time kind of with her family when we were young and dad wanted to go back um, and let us have some time with his parents. So we actually ended up, my sister and I went to the same like high school as my dad um, in England, which was quite interesting. Um, and it means my accent is like a little funky. Uh, when I'm talking to British people, it gets even more British. And then when I get like really emotional, it gets even more American. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's like a weird situation. Um, I can but yeah, hear I feel it. very I lucky. Can tell. Too. I can so, tell when she's like, it's, it's, it's yeah. like when we first were introducing everybody before we started rolling with the podcast, I had no idea. But then as Mike asked you the question and you started speaking, I was like, oh, she is British somewhat. Yeah. Yeah. Also, when I talk about like British things, it comes back. <laughs> like tea and <laughs> biscuits a, or <laughs> like tea and biscuits. Yeah. yeah. Actually, my roommate yesterday, she, there's this, this is a complete tangent. There's this thing called clotted cream from where I'm from in Cornwall, in England, which is called Cornwall. And if you've ever seen like the scones with like jam and cream on them, I don't know if you've ever been to England, had a cream tea, that's what it's called. She found some um, yesterday at Whole Foods. So I'm very excited. This evening I'm gonna be making scones and we're having a full cream tea. Nice. So <laughs> when, is, when is generally like uh, tea time, tea and biscuit time during the day? Like what, what time of day do we, uh, do we generally get tea and biscuits and how often? So that kind of depends on the family. I think like the official-ish time is like 4 p.m. Um, but when I was at home during quarantine, my dad and sister are like worse than I am. They both constantly drink tea. So it's like you get up, you have coffee, and then you have tea at 10, tea at 11, lunch, tea at one, tea at two, tea at three, tea at four, maybe like an hour off, dinner, <laughs> and then like another couple of cups after. So I'd be on like seven or eight cups of tea a day. All caffeinated, um, I hope not. Yeah, yeah, all caffeinated. Oh man, how do you sleep? <laughs> but it's really have funny. You, tea oh doesn't affect goodness. me. <laughs> have you created like tea time for the fencing team? Do you guys get in on this, James and Leanne? No, oh, she has not... been. What's going on, Maria? No, I haven't. <laughs> Although I did once um, a couple years ago for Mardi Gras in England, it's called Pancake Day. And I did have like a pancake day thing um, my sophomore year that everyone was, we all came to, which was really fun. Yeah, that was, that was a good time. <laughs> I think you might have to slowly wean everybody in if you were going to start tea time. I don't know if everybody would be able to do eight times a day. Uh, they wouldn't be able to go to sleep at night. I saw Anika's yeah, face when probably. you said it, and I we mentioned it was all caffeinated, and I don't I don't think uh, Anika drinks <laughs> that much caffeine based on that response. <laughs> And I have to stay up for classes until 5.30 p.m. Eastern, and I still don't drink. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but but I did actually introduce Anika to a really good decaf tea. Puka. Yeah. And I found this it is really tea. good. Um, yeah. It's like licorice and mint. And it's like the best tea. If you don't want caffeine. <laughs> I'm not a huge tea drinker. The only tea we have is uh, sleepy time tea from the store that my wife drinks sometimes mm -hmm. to help her go to sleep. You know, not definitely not an English thing at all. Definitely not. Definitely would be frowned upon. <laughs> definitely. As James yeah. brings his that coffee good, into the fold. So James, what kind of coffee are you drinking? We're going to turn the attention to you for a second. I'm just drinking black coffee right now. I carry a coffee maker everywhere I go. Just because I don't drink eight to nine cups of tea, but I do drink about that many <laughs> cups of coffee. But I, just, I have a coffee maker. It's the smallest coffee maker I've ever seen. It's actually like my favorite object in the world. It's a single serve coffee maker, which is very hard to find, turns out. Um, but I just carry it with me every, everywhere I go. And I've, been, I've also carried my laptop now, like since we've been doing all um, classes online. So I just carry my laptop. I carry my coffee maker. And I go around just random parts of the city and I do my classes and... Is it battery parts. operated? It's no, I, I plug into outlets. I know pretty much every public outlet in New York right now. Um, <laughs> mid, it, like Upper West Side is pretty easy. Um, obviously, on Columbia's campus, I am here right now, but um, that's easy. But in Midtown, it gets harder. But now I, I feel like I know pretty much every single public outlet. I drink, yeah, I drink heard. coffee with random people as well. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah. <laughs> well, they probably see you plug in a coffee maker and it's probably the first time anybody's ever seen that in public and then it just sparks a conversation. Which is kind of surprising, right? You'd think people would carry around coffee makers. No. People just go and buy the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so, much, it's so much cheaper. And do you know how much other things you can make with this? You can make 
oatmeal. You can you could actually hard boil eggs in it. I've done. You could do you could eat for so, days just off of. So where do you it. where do you get where do you get the water while you're out? Do you just carry bottles of water or? Yeah, I fill up these um and I just carry them around in my bag. Uh, um, do you wait for it to rain and uh, <laughs> just hold your coffee maker open? I actually have used rainwater before, but, um, <laughs> but the one place I should have known. I should have known. In Macy's on Macy's on Thirty Fourth Street, don't use the sink water for the bathrooms because it tastes disgusting, and I do, I don't know if there's an issue with this yet, but I know that the taste is completely off. I'll keep that in mind for when I'm at Macy's on 34th Street with my coffee maker. With that being said, <laughs> if it's raining outside or if you don't want to be outside, the furniture department there, beautiful. But you can sit there and nobody says anything. I've only gotten kicked out one time and I've been there like, do I don't you know. You make how many coffee times. in the furniture department? I do, yeah. That's amazing. Wow. Except you, you, can, you can sit on all the couches and everything, but they don't like it when you sleep on the bed. So we're I learning, feel- we're, we're, I feel like we're learning where the energy comes from on the, you know, on the celebrations and everything right now. It's all caffeine, <laughs> ca- caffeine driven. It has nothing to do with caffeine. Do, right you bring it, do you bring it to the fencing matches? Do you bring, I don't know, is that allowed? Is that, a, would that be a bad thing if you're drinking coffee during your fencing? Um, I have never done that. With that being said, I've only become such a religious coffee drinker since uh, we've uh, had the, everything canceled in like late March of last year so i haven't had the opportunity to do that i'm not sure if i would um but i've never actually drank that much coffee while fencing i drank coffee while fencing but all it was like i have a ton of energy irrespective of if i'm drinking coffee or not so it's not it's not directly from the caffeine <laughs> maybe we know where's where the extra energy comes from now i feel like both both times we've had him on when we had him on lion's feud and now he is he is pumped if you talk to random strangers, it gives you energy. That's true. That's true. There's no place. Are you to saying, that, are you saying that you're talking to random strangers right now? Is that is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Well, you know, we have met before uh, on this screen, on the same screen, probably on this. The- <laughs> is this cool? Do you, do you feel connected to me? Are we? Are we like? I do. Them? I feel like I know you now. I feel like I do. <laughs> Actually, to be well, I right feel now, like if I ever see somebody drinking with a coffee machine in public, I'll immediately think of you. <laughs> Actually, right now I have your video pinned, so I feel like I'm looking right into your eyes. Oh, that is. Uh, I don't know if I would do that if I were you. I don't suggest that to anybody. We're it's okay. Move... By the end, we'll be like this. Okay, we will. I mean, I already said that I was. I already said that I was. I want to move to Leanne. I'm gonna. I'm gonna let that simmer uh, <laughs> and I'm, gonna, <laughs> and I'm gonna i'm gonna move to leanne leanne where are you located right now oh, i'm currently in new jersey just like back in my hometown baskin ridge a couple hours away from anika or like an hour away from anika's like hometown i think so i don't know did you give it give it like a wave for her every once in a while because yeah like, yeah she totally hasn't, exactly. she hasn't she hasn't seen it oh, my family i say hi <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You know what's interesting to me when you glance over the fencing roster is that there's so many of you from like New York and New Jersey, and then it's like New York and there's like New York and New Jersey or all over the world. It's like there's very little like anywhere else in the United States. Like, but why do you guys think that is? Man, I don't really know. I think it's like I guess like most of like the fencing clubs are like kind of centralized in like New York, New Jersey, and then like specifically like Los Angeles, California, or like Houston, Texas. Like those are like, I guess, the biggest ones I've noticed. Um, but as to why specifically New York, New Jersey, like I have no idea. I guess like high school fencing is like kind of big in New Jersey at least that I can say, but um, I'm not sure for New York, but yeah. But do you guys feel like that gives you kind of like a, like, at least I don't know something to talk about when you when you're freshman and you come in and you see people that like I'm sure like Leanne and Anika maybe you didn't know each other before Columbia but you guys are from pretty close you know I feel like if you're from New Jersey you pretty much know where the other person's from it's not that big of a state so no, you yeah, like kind of like, like helps you adjust yeah definitely like talking about experiences like shared experiences in like high school fencing and how sometimes awful <laughs> Um, I just like having like shared instances of just like you know craziness that does happen in you know like those kind of events 
uh, definitely connect us in a way that you know we we are we're just able to have a conversation about it. Yeah. Have any of you competed against each other in high school before you got to Columbia, or have any of your teammates that you know? Or even international competitions. Yeah. Or like international that, yeah. competitions, yeah. I've competed before I came to Columbia. I competed against um, one of the girls who graduated last year from the women's saber team. She actually, we came up against each other in like the direct elimination rounds at two World Cups in a row, right before and right after I got in. Um, so that was kind of crazy because it was like we knew each other for years. Um, and then it was like, oh, like we're going to be teammates. That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, it was, it was strange. Um, That's pretty true for all offensers. The, but, yeah. especially on our team yeah like we have, we have three weapons and within your respective weapon you yeah. pretty much know everybody like I, i'm a men's spoilist and so i've known um andrew zane ashton daniel Sarah Kumba, sam mullis beforehand um june paik i've known all them like my, literally my whole life like i have photos of me fencing andrew zane when i was like we were six years old um so like we've pretty much known each other for, for forever Cross weapons, it's a, I mean, we know a good amount of us, um, but it's, it's like not an it's entirely not, different sport. Right, yeah. Well, and I mean, we're, we're congregated in like similar tournaments. So that's yeah. why we have like a good amount of um, still communication between different weapons. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously once we come onto the like college scene, um, even cross between um, different teams, we just like all get to know each other. But like beforehand, it's mostly like in your weapon, it would be surprising if you didn't know the people who we have coming in like when oh. we recruit we just yeah, all yeah. pretty much know everybody like everything about them as we're like considering different types of people. i was gonna say talk about the specific differences as you're kind of learning how to you know coming up in, in the junior ranks with your weapon and james i think you said online to you the weapon chooses you you don't choose the weapon um but like the specific differences between like epe foil and saber like it, what is it that you feel like separates one from the other? Yeah, in terms of your ability, in terms of what you need to like your skill and like how to approach using that weapon for people like myself who don't know that much. I mean, like, I don't want to be like, you know, kind of basic about it, but it's like, I, I also don't want to like, dumb down fencing but basically i feel like the three weapons can be summed up in a buzzfeed personality quiz like <laughs> they're like some like archetypes of like i don't know people can fit into certain weapons and i mean obviously like there are people you know who you know fence uh, choose like their weapon and stuff or the weapon chooses them as james says but um yeah i don't know like I think it's like the styles that are different too. Just like, like I don't, don't want to be like speed for saber. I feel like if you like to go fast, oh, you should choose saber. <laughs> 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 uh, I don't want to call it's them true out. In some ways, though. Uh, but I mean, I can say the same thing for my weapon, which is like epe, and like you know, you gotta be really slow, you gotta be patient or something. And um, I don't know. That's basically it. But oil is. They come with their own demeanors. I think, I mean, for me, I, I started fencing at a saber only club, so I had no choice. And I remember for a few meets, Mike had put me in for foil and it was just so strange having to change because you're not just changing how you're moving, you're changing how you're thinking. And even the time that you're taking in between touches and it was just a totally different experience. And it's always so strange having to feel like you're going to square one. I mean, even at practices, sometimes when for coordination practice, you're fencing lefty as opposed to righty, like it feels very, um, self-deprecating way but that's it's very humbling as well just to be able to try different weapons I think for us they were I agree it is the fastest it's very aggressive it's very um also the most fun I want to say it's the sporty I, that there? Of the three. <laughs> I, I agree it is definitely the Listen, most like I'm, fun, I, like I'm telling you all out there like I'd rather be watching Saber than Epic <laughs> <laughs> coming from Leanne who fences Epic. like I don't want to watch anybody with my weapon I want to watch Sabres yeah Sabres the firmest the Kaiser, the Kaiser roll so but right, you're not calling right. yourself soft like a croissant though James are you no I'm calling myself fruity like the marmalade you spread on it <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, what did, what does the Wonder Bread mean? What do you mean by Wonder? Are we like basic? You trying to go with basic? For the Wonder I wouldn't bread? say basic, but basic? no, I wouldn't say as much basic as it would be that. You know, Wonder Bread reliable. Re- that's what I was reliable, going but you know, you could do a lot with Wonder Bread. You know, like if you get a croissant, there's a, so much that you're going to put on it, and it's always going to be a little, you know, zesty. Um, like you're not going to have a croissant that's going to be bland. And with Wonder Bread, there is obviously the potential for it to just be a piece of Wonder Bread. But from there, each different individual, because, you know, I would say Epe is the most, I guess, rudimentary of the weapons, right? Like, you aren't given a lot just handed to you in terms of, like, making it interesting. Like Leon said, it's not inherently the most interesting of the weapons, right? It's not inherently the most, I guess, would you want to call it athletic or whatever you want to be. But it can be in all those different areas, right? So with Wonder Bread, you know, you can put a slice of bologna on it, or you could put a little bit of turkey, or you could spread a little bit of marmalade on it. You could also put Nutella. You could do all these different things with Wonder Bread, but you need to put it on, right? Like, if you got a Kaiser roll, like, okay, you put a slice of bologna on and you're good to go. With a with Wonder Bread, you got to manipulate a little more, but sometimes when you have a little bit more to, like, do to actually make it good, sometimes it's all that much better when you're eating it. That was deep. I don't know. Leanne, that was your opinion. Sad. Yeah. <laughs> what would it give to be inside James's head just for like 10 seconds? <laughs> I wouldn't last any longer than 10 seconds. I don't know if that's a coffee machine. I think, I don't know. I don't know. We're going to have to. No, like, I think guess. that came straight from James's heart. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. All right. I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I, well, I before talk... you switch gears, okay, Mike, go I think this is a good time to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to have more with the fencing team. If you didn't like that, I don't know what you really like when you listen to podcasts. So stick around. At Athletic Brewing Company, we've built America's first craft non-alcoholic brewery. We've created a lineup of award-winning non-alcoholic beers. Our beers are made with organic grains and start at only 50 calories. Athletic beers are perfect for anyone who loves being healthy and active, but also loves to enjoy great tasting beer with friends. To give us a try, go to athleticbrewingcompany.com and use code ATHLETIC20 for 20% off your first order. We all know what comes with being a fan, the ups, the downs, and everything in between. Share a Coke with a friend. Coca-Cola, the official beverage of the Columbia Lions. We take care of the whole recovery process, getting them back to the level they were before they got injured, and many times even better. What's involved is preserving dreams. The first thing I do with any athlete is figure out their goals and then try to make a plan based upon that. One of the things that people don't quite understand about team physicians is how invested we are in these people's lives. We don't look at you as a guy with a shoulder problem. We try to understand what it is that makes you tick back with the captains of the fencing program here at Columbia. Um, wanted to ask you guys about that. Um, it's a storied program and for you four to be selected as captains is such a storied program. What does that mean to you? What does that mean to be a you know part of this leadership committee? So I'll start with you, Anika. Oh gosh, I, this if you had told me a few years ago that I would be not only fencing for Columbia, but just in this situation at all, it's, it would be absolutely incredible. It's been the most incredible honor, I think, to make fencing, to, to have it transition my fencing career by coming to Columbia and that you start as an individual fencer. And fencing is always an individual sport, but only in these four collegiate years do you really feel like there's this other added element, as James would say, that's the marmalade to the uh, Wonder Bread that normal fencing can be. Um, and just the the relationships you make, and Mike always reminds us, we really are a family. And, and I knew coming to Columbia that I was not just gonna have fencing, I was not just gonna have fun, but I was gonna have a family. And it's so important to have that because fencing is so individual, not only that you're fencing one other person, but you're really fighting with yourself and having it become a team sport has really been uh, the most incredible gift and has bolstered my performance in the sport so much. Yeah. Um, it's a tough follow. It's a tough follow for any of the other three of you. Uh, I don't know. It's it means everything, honestly. Like um, the reason I'm at Columbia is obviously for fencing. Um, first and foremost, obviously, like the education thing too. But the reason I'm here is to be a part of this team, um, and it's so much more than I ever imagined. Even watch, like I remember sitting 
at home watching like all of the hype videos from years past when I was looking at what schools I wanted to go to and like Columbia was always just like the coolest and like the best um and like being on this team has completely changed me as a person um it's taught me so much about myself it's, it's also cliche but it's true like I never would have expected to be like an NCAA champion like a three-time Ivy champion it's crazy and it's all because of our team and the like foundation that Mike has built um I think is incredible and the way that we all interact with each other um I haven't seen it in any other teams I've been a part of in my athletic career or in life in general um and yeah and now like being one of on like the leadership committee as you call it um and seeing kind of what goes on behind the scenes and being able to like play a role in that has been really interesting um I think the first couple of years, Mike makes us do random things um, that I think most other teams don't do. Like we, every summer we have like a movie assignment and everyone has to watch like three movies and write a report about them. And I remember my freshman and sophomore year, I was kind of like, this doesn't really make any sense. Junior year, I was like, I don't know if I'm gonna do this. Um, and then seeing kind of the behind the scenes of the reasoning why Mike wants us to do things and kind of how it's all put together has been so interesting and so valuable. Um, I think it's given me like an even deeper appreciation for the sport and the program and just everything. Um, and now I'm like, I'm graduating in a couple months. And so I'm getting like very emotional about everything to do with Columbia. Um, but I've been reflecting a lot on like everything this program has given me. And I'm so glad to have been able to give something back in some small way. I don't know if we, I don't know, are we gonna, are we gonna <laughs> go all the way around the horn here? Uh, Mike, that's up to you. Yeah, no, if you guys have anything else to add, go for it. Yeah, I mean, when I was, like, looking at schools, um, there's, like, this – I don't know if any of you guys had this experience, but there would be people who would tell me – who obviously had no real business talking about Columbia Fencing Team because they weren't on it or had no real experience, but they were like, oh, Columbia Fencing Team's not really a team um, because we don't really have required practices, which is a weird thing to say. I mean, we do. We have, like, I guess two a week, and then we have one, like, training session – which is like really low. I mean, for any athletic team, but especially like a fencing team um, where you have like other teams, like even like division three teams who are trained like six, sometimes seven times a week. And we are, we are, but we're doing it essentially out of our own volition. We are texting each other and creating our own practices. Um, we go to the clubs in the New York area because we have some of the best clubs. But I think at the end of the day, we're together a stupid, stupid amount. I see the fencing team especially when we're on campus, an absolutely ridiculous amount. Like we spend all of our time together. We live together. We eat together. We obviously train together. We study together. We do everything together. Um, but the crazy thing is that we don't have to do that at all. The way that Michael has set up this team is that we are not required to be around each other that much, but we are, um, which is what kind of makes us so special that every single time that we spend time together, we're doing it because we know that we want to, because we care about each other and we just like spending time with each other. And I think that that develops our bonds to each other like that much more. Where like right now, I mean, I, all of my best friends are on the fencing team. And I think that's true for like pretty much anybody on the team right now that uh, whoever it may be, like we come onto the team and you just find the team. It's, it's the most welcoming team who just, gets 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 along together and we just spend every second of the day together just because we want to which is a little bit different from other teams where yeah a lot of teams spend a lot of time together but we don't have to we just do it do you see uh the team at some point completely like getting back together for like some kind of reunion maybe over the summer when everything's uh when everything's better and you know everybody can actually be in the same place i can all but guarantee you that Okay. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> where's it, it going to be? Where's it going to be? I want to know. Rochester, New York. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'd have to vote Greece if it were me. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I'll, I'll vote oh, Greece too. Same, you have to come to Greece. <laughs> yeah, I'm also a Greek. My parents were born there. Nice. Oh, very nice. Yeah. All right, Leanne. Uh, yeah, I'll let you hit this subject. I mean... Yeah, I'm in the same boat as Maria. I'm a senior now, so I've spent all four years with this team. So, you know, like having a captain at the end of it is just like kind of cherry on top. But I feel like even when we're not captains, right, Mike really fosters this kind of, you know, anyone can be a leader on our team. 
like anyone can step up and really just you know help each other just push forward you know really like like there's no difference between me and my other squad mates I would say like other than like you know we get we're like the kind of bridge between Mike and like getting the news out to the teams but really like anyone like my squad mates can really just step forward and just be like hey you know I want to practice you know let's set this up let's you know get together and do things and I think that's like what's really special about this team and I'm really proud to be selected like we the way that we choose captains too literally we have a voting system so like we were luckily enough to be like you know chosen by our squad mates to 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 become captains and you know I know some you know maybe other teams might be like you know the coach like the selects you know who's the best you know who has done the like who has the best record or something but literally like you know Michael just you know lets people who want to become captain run and and the rest is you know up up to our, our team so I think that kind of attitude towards leadership is really special and I'm definitely gonna miss miss the team you know it's it's been great um, yeah <laughs> it's been a great experience yeah talk about the relationship that this team kind of has and you hit on it some I think Maria hit on it some and you, like first of all the thing that like stands out to me is you all refer to your coach just as Mike right <laughs> <laughs> he was basically it's, the dad of the team. Yeah. yeah he's such a dad so we talk yeah. you know a lot of other student athletes you know yeah which I mean, there's nothing wrong with it but you know most of the time it's common to refer to your coach as coach you, you call him coach off fatigue or you know sometimes coach Michael or coach Mike but you guys are just like it's Mike right? <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> how does like uh like when you come in as freshmen is that something that you already know is that something that you have to get used to uh is that like is it and it's definitely I feel like part of the culture with the fencing program at Columbia and like the, the culture that you guys have definitely like a hit it's just like at first you're just like oh what what should I like call him you know and then you hear all your teams around it's like oh hey Mike Mike you know whatever <laughs> it's like oh yeah Mike said this or like you know it, and it's just like is, is he okay with, with us just calling him Mike? And I'm like, he'll just come up to you. He's like, oh, hey, you know, it's like, oh, hey, Mike. And it just comes out because his attitude is just literally just like so nice, I guess, to the team. Yeah. And I think it's also like, like one of us. Yeah. yeah, exactly. He's like, like, we all have his number and it's completely normal to just text him about anything. Mm -hmm. Like, literally, like, if you're struggling with anything or like you think something's funny people will text him like I was um two of the freshmen are actually in the city right now on my squad and I was training with them downtown a couple weeks ago and we just sent a selfie to Mike and he was like oh my gosh it's like so exciting to see you all together like it's a very relaxed atmosphere because like he just knows that he loves us so much and we really respect him and it's like we love him back it's definitely like a mutual relationship I even remember my first week on campus, I had like just started and I got sick because everybody freshman year gets sick at some point. And he had sent me a video, text me a video of his son saying, feel better. And like his son was just learning how to feel like, feel better. But it was just this, this way of feeling welcome into the family that like, you know, you're part of the family of every single person in that family. And it's, it's just such a nice thing to come into, especially when you know, I was from New Jersey. I had not gone far for school, but I still felt very isolated. And so having the team and having a coach that was so willing to be transparent and communicative and really invite us into everything from the outset was really important. Yeah, I don't really know, for better or worse, I like kind of just text Michael as like, he's like a friend of mine. Um, yeah. it's, like, it's like kind of weird, but like, I, I don't even know if we would like call him, like if, if we, if you asked us, what is Mike to us? I don't know if anybody would really like respond coach. Um, like, I don't really know exactly what we would respond, but it wouldn't, I, I don't think that word would necessarily do justice to our relationship to him. It's like, I mean, obviously, since we have different weapons, right, he's not directly all of our actual fencing, which I don't really know as much in, like, other sports how yeah. involved they are. I know in other sports it, it is more involved. Like, my uncle's a soccer coach at a, at a University of Rochester, and I know he directly goes and coaches everybody, right? Like, um, he is, like, their go-to about, like, technical advice for the sport. We have, like, other coaches on the team. We have Sungwoo, Aki, um, Alex, 
right now on, on the team who are essentially providing that technical advice to us. So Michael's there as like this kind of guiding force that puts everything together, right? Um, and it's like oftentimes pretty invisible, but it's like on a team where you essentially have three squads, but then you also divide that into men's and women's and you have people going training at all different parts of the city. You know, there is sometimes this difficulty in holding all that together in like some sort of organized structure. And Michael's just this kind of like glue that holds everything in that way. Like it's not, like if you tell somebody, oh, my fencing coach, like you have a completely different idea of who Michael Averstick is to us. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Mm -hmm. I, I've thrown this analogy out a few times in other conversations. It's almost like, you know, for people that are listening and follow baseball, it's like being a baseball coach and having all your hitters have a different batting coach. It, it's kind of like that, you know, you're just kind of setting the lineup, but you kind of, you know, the, the fencing, you just kind of let your athletes kind of do what they've been trained to do. And it's, it's kind of, it's, it's a very unique situation for people that don't follow the sport and everything like that. So he's kind of almost like, you know, almost more like a, a general manager. He's picking who he wants to recruit and who he wants to come in, who's going to fit in with the, within the culture. And I think he's done, obviously, based on what you're saying about the team culture and everything, he's done a good job of filling those needs from a year to year and it's it's and you guys reward him with you all reward him with competing for national championships and winning them and ivy league championships and you know it, it goes beyond that with the relationships you've built so it's it's really impressive to hear that there's a reason mike loves the moving money ball <laughs> <laughs> we've all seen the ted talk <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness. Another point that I did want to hit on before we let uh, our fencing captains go, and I know we talked about this the last time we had fencers on a podcast, but we didn't necessarily talk about it with this group, is fencing, you know, is an individual sport for the most part. And college fencing is what is unique because it turns it into like a team competition. So, and uh, I don't know, if, I don't want to put anything ahead of about the same way your teammates felt but when you won the national championship a couple of years back what did that feel like as a team to have that six like to, to be able to have that compared to any individual title like do you hold that team national championship as like it doesn't have to necessarily be more special than maybe an individual championship but just like the fact that you all got to celebrate winning something together no, I would definitely say it's more special. Um, I mean, that's our goal. That's our goal throughout the year. That's our goal when we go to practice to win a national championship. So win an Ivy championship too. Um, but to win a team NCAA championship, that's, I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but I'm pretty sure like in general, when we all come to practice, that's our goal. Um, that's why we want to be so, that's why we want to be good fencers. It's so that we can all go and we can support each other and get a national championship. Um, I remember, like, I didn't fence a national championship um, my freshman year when we won, um, but I was there. And I can tell you that it, the second that we all won, it was unbelievably emotional for everybody um, in a way that, like, I can't uh, compare to any other moment in the sport. I've been fencing 14 years um, and had a lot of moments where, you know, I've been happy with how I fence. There's a lot of moments I've been, you know, upset. Um, but in terms of emotion, there's nothing that even comes remotely close, at least for me, and I think for a lot of our team, to the moment of winning a national championship. Because in some way, it just gives a validity to all everything that we've built together. And it's not just our practices. It gives validity to us eating together on a you know Thursday night. It gives validity to us calling each other at 3 a.m. and then going and helping each other on homework. It, in all these different aspects that don't seem necessarily to be related to the idea of fencing, I feel like in some way that just gave us in some way, like, I guess, you know, validity to everything. It just made us feel like all of our connections and all of our different um, friendships are just that much more meaningful because we were able to come together and do something that we set our goal from the beginning on. And it's something that we feel so special. Yeah, I think, yeah, I agree. There's like nothing like, college fencing in the fencing world um and there's nothing like winning a national ch a title in any sport I think um 
And I remember like the night before, I also was um, at that competition, but didn't actually like compete myself um, when we won. But I remember the night before the last day, um, it's like a kind of a thing. We all got together in this one room and like people were feeling down. It was this whole thing. We didn't know what was gonna happen the next day. And literally everyone spoke, even people who weren't fencing and just said like how much we care about each other and how important this team is to all of us and how like that's what counts at the end of the day. And I think that's kind of like everything we've been saying about our team, right? Is like, it is about the whole team. Um, and like, whether you fence or not, like I didn't fence, it's still my title. Um, and like, that's also something that Mike thinks is super important. Like everybody who's has a finger in gets a ring. Um, like our lift coach has got a ring. Like the people who like wash our dirty laundry, they deserve seven rings. <laughs> it's disgusting. <laughs> but like everyone, everyone's a part of our team, right? Um, and I think that's what makes it so special is that like, okay, only 12 people get defense, but the 60 people, 70 people who make up our team are all like the ones who win. Does anybody uh, have uh, a confetti from the celebration safe still? Yeah, I do. It's actually do at home. <laughs> you do? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I know that's the thing. I, I see people take the confetti, you know, uh, when they win championships and the confetti cannons go off and uh, you know, take it and I don't know if you've got it framed or just tucked in a sock Mine's drawer. Just in my room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that meeting Maria was talking about the night before, everybody just cried. Everybody. Yeah, cried. literally everyone cried. It was just everybody. Except for Jared Paul. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't cry. <laughs> I remember that. He was crying on the inside, though. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We know yeah. some of you got to get going. Uh, we're going to wrap things up. We want to thank the four captains of the fencing program for joining us. It's been really good hearing from you. Hope all is well and good luck the rest of the semester. Thank you. Thank you. It's been Wishing you a great day. So yeah. that'll do it for this episode of the Roarcast. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. We'll be back again soon. Uh, make sure you check us out on Twitch on Mondays at 10 a.m. or any major podcast platform, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, iTunes. Search for Columbia Athletics and subscribe today. Leave us some comments. So for Kyle Matrician, I'm Mike Walski. We'll talk to you soon. Jared, you need to cry more. <laughs> <laughs>